ought to shout a praise. Amen. I know we can do better than that. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Good job, choir. Amen. You got to call them. Morning, noon, and night. Anybody believe that? Anybody tried it? Have you tried them for yourself? Have you tried them for yourself? Hallelujah. If you haven't, just keep living. Just keep living. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord. The psalmist tells us, he says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for he is steadfast. His love endures forever. And then he says, Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. We want to welcome you this Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, to the celebration of a risen Savior. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand for loving us, for keeping us, for making a way for us, for blessing us. Amen. We give honor to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord to be back in church. I don't, I don't see how folks can stay out of church. Amen. Hallelujah. I can't understand it. Amen. Amen. We missed one Sunday. I thought I was about ready to lose my life. Amen. Goodness, man. We truly give honor to the Lord. The Lord is truly greatly to be praised. Amen. It's good to be in the house one more time. Amen. Somebody didn't wake up on this side. But the Lord in his graciousness, in his long suffering, and his kindness, he allowed us to wake up to see a new day. And we're eternally grateful for this day he's given us. Amen. Amen. We've been talking as we close out today, looking at a great study. Amen. We've been in the Old Testament. Amen. We've been looking at an old classic story in the Old Testament. We've been checking out uh, the Old Testament patriarch Isaac and his wife Rebecca. Amen. Sad to say that a lot of folks no longer read the Old Testament. But it's in the Old Testament that you learn how to live a New Testament life. Let me say that again. It's in the Old Testament that you learn how to live a New Testament life. Amen. And we were looking at this story with Isaac, brother Isaac and his wife, Rebecca. But our focus has been on their twin boys. Amen. The twins. Amen. And we can learn a lot from Esau and Jacob. We can learn so much, amen? We can learn great biblical truth as we look at this biblical Old Testament narrative, amen? We can learn a lot from these brothers, amen? And that's what we want to go back to. We, we had some gaps of time, amen? We had Mother's Day and, and, and we had the children's celebration, but we're back. We want to go back and our look in the book of Genesis, and we want to go back into our examination of this, our examination of the imperfect, godly family that a perfect God can still use. Let me tell you right now, watch this. You may have a lovely family. You may have a great family. You may have even a kingdom family. But you don't have a perfect family. Let me say that again, because somebody, somebody in here, you think you got a, no, no, you don't have a perfect family, amen? But I'm so glad that we serve a God who, who, who is not so much looking for perfection as he's looking for those who are striving towards holiness. Aren't you glad about that? And so God is able to use an imperfect godly family he can still use on the earth to get out this great gospel. I want to draw your attention to the book of Genesis. Amen. Back into our study. And the 25th chapter. And, and we're going to look at the narrative as specifically. Specifically. Genesis 25 verses 19 through 34. Amen. This is our fourth sermon as we work our way through this. These 15 or so verses, amen? And I told you that these verses 
have many different moving parts. Amen. And, and, and I just want to encourage you that after we close out today, I want you to go back. I want you to go back and I want you to look at the story. I want you to look at chapters 26 and 27 and 28. I want you to look at the story of Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob. Amen. Genesis 25, verses 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethiel, the Armin of Padon Aram, the sister of Laban, the Armin, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife. We need some more brothers praying for their wives. Amen. Amen. Because she was burned. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. And the one shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there was twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. God bless that brother. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was cooking stew, our main preaching text, and once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him, sold his birthright. To Jacob and Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went his way thus Esau despised his birthright father we come thanking and praising you for this glorious day it's a day that you have made you have commanded that we who are your blood washed children that we should rejoice and be glad therein and so we come rejoicing in the fact that you have chose yet another day to allow us to be on this side of the Jordan. We thank you for the fact that you have given us the faculties of our limbs and a sound mind. We thank you for the fact that you, God, the Holy Spirit, permeates within our hearts and our minds and our souls. We, we thank you that the praise comes from you, God, the Holy Spirit, that the worship comes from you, God, the Holy Spirit, that our life is wrapped up and tangled up in Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Now, Lord God, we need a rhema word. We need a teaching word. We need a developing word. We need a word that will grow us up to look more like you. Touch this congregation. Continue to use this congregation for your glory and for your name's sake. Now, Lord God, take us down into the treasures of your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. You may have your seats. The imperfect godly family that a perfect God can still use. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord for that. Amen. We've been looking at, we've been learning from this biblical narrative how God can take an imperfect godly family, a perfect God, and still use them for his glory. We can look into the life of Isaac, who was imperfect. 
Rebecca, who was imperfect, even Jacob. And we can see that God can use a family for his glory. And now today, we want to more specifically focus on this word out of Genesis. Amen. We want to look at this. We want to go back and we want to talk about the two twins, the two twin brothers. Amen. And one thing, let me say this before we open this up. Uh, both brothers, both brothers, get this, we can relate to this, were born, raised up under the same spiritual legacy. Both twin brothers, walk with me for a minute, both twin brothers grew up in the same godly line. Both twin brothers grew up under the same covenantal promises. Both twin brothers Amen. From the same mom and dad, grew up with the same godly ancestry. Amen. They had praying grandparents. Amen. Pretty sure that Abraham, the grandfather, led them and showed them great things. And Sarah, they had a godly mom and dad out of Isaac and Rebecca. Wasn't perfect parents, but they were godly parents. That's the difference. Amen. Hallelujah. We got to let some things go because we always looking for a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. But the question is, was I raised under godly parents? You got to get a witness. And, 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 they, and so as we look at this, we see that these two twin brothers, they, they came up under the same Jehovah, the same Yahweh, the same Elohim, the same El Shaddai, they came under the same banner out of the same family. I'm going somewhere this morning because we're going to see how this still is in operation today. Amen? But as we look at this and understand this, the, the twin brothers were diametrically opposite. Even though they came up from a godly line, they were diametrically opposite from each other. Amen. They were diametrically opposite in nature. They were diametrically opposite in value. They were diametrically opposite in attitude. The two brothers were diametrically opposite in views, the philosophies of life. The two brothers that grew up under the same banner, they had different views. Amen. Different commitment. And they even had a different view when it came down, watch this, to the family. They, the two brothers, paternal twins, they had different views, different philosophies. Two brothers that came up in the same home. Somebody know what I'm talking about. Under the same blood-stained banner, but totally opposite from each other. And so if you look at this and understand this, uh, this is an epic paradigm that reveals something in this text. And this is what we're going to look at and close out on today with these two brothers. It, 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 reveals, it reveals children of the flesh versus children of the spirit in one family. It reveals the children of a fleshly commitment versus the children of a spiritual commitment in one family. It reveals the children of fleshliness and worldliness versus the children of spiritualness and eternality in the same family. That's what we see in this family, an imperfect family that a perfect God can still use. Amen? And, and let me say this before we get in this. There's only two realms. I want you to understand this. Rooted, wake up. There's only two realms. Either you're in the worldly realm or you're in the spiritual realm. There's no in-between ground. There's, there's no in-between. There's only two realms. And, and watch this. By the grace of God, you have to decide what realm you're going to travel in. What realm are you going to pinch your tent in? What realm are you going to live in? Are you going to live in the worldly, fleshly realm or the spiritual and eternal realm? And that's a decision that God allows you to make. But watch this. When you make it, you got to get ready for the consequences that come with it. There's only two realms. 
And so as we look at this and understand this story, there's so much we can glean out of the Old Testament. We need folks to get back to the Bible. Amen? And we look at this famous encounter between Esau's physical hunger versus Jacob's spiritual hunger. Amen? I want you to see it this morning. Amen? And I want you to understand this. Watch this. Listen to this. Listen up, church. Because one is born into a family that is Christ-centered and committed to, to the worship and the service and the obedience to God doesn't mean that this is automatically transferred into the life, into the soul of all who are physically a part of that family. Let me say that again. Because, watch this, you was raised up under a spiritual banner. Does not necessitate that all of a sudden spirituality is now transferred into your soul. I want you to understand that. And we see that with these two twins, amen? And we have to understand that, amen? And the church needs to understand. Did you hear me? It, there's, you can't transfer this thing over. And, and so I hear folks say all the time, well, I grew up all my life in church. All my life I grew up in church. I know all about church, amen? I have church folks all in my family, all in my family, my mama, my, my grandfather, my aunts, my uncles. Uh, I, I went to a Christian school. I came up under a Christian school, and, and watch this, I love this one. I was baptized when I was a kid. I was baptized when I was a kid, but, but no, 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 that isn't it. See, that isn't it. And see, as we look at the Old Testament narrative here, it reveals to us that that's not it. See, Jesus said, Jesus said to, to Nicodemus, Jesus said in John 3 through 7, he says, Jesus answered him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he end a second time until his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, we're getting away from preaching like this. Amen? We're getting away from this. Amen? And, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. I love what Jesus says. Watch this. Jesus says, this thing ain't transferable because you was raised up in a Christian home, because you got Christians all in your family, amen, because you went to a Christian school, because you've been baptized. No, no, you must. You must be born again. You must be born again. Amen. And so as we look at these two twins, Esau and Jacob, Go back to the old story. See, now when someone says, you know the old story, you should be able to say, amen, I know the old story. Amen? I know the old story about, about Jacob and Esau and Isaac and, and their mama, Rebecca. Amen? And so as we go back and we look at the old story, the true story of Esau and, 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 and Jacob reveals this truth. Amen? And watch this. In the last sermon... We investigated the life of Jacob. Y'all remember, if y'all remember, we go back a couple weeks. Amen. If not, one thing good about YouTube, you can always pull up old sermons. And we went back and we looked at the life of Jacob and we came up, watch this, we concluded with a biblical conclusion about Jacob. And, we, and that was that Jacob, even though he was a son, even though he was the youngest son, he was appointed and elected and chosen by God to do what? To receive the inheritance. Watch this. Listen to this. God can do what he want to do, how he wants to do it, with who he wants to do it to. You can say what you want. You can think what you want. But the last time I checked the book, he is sovereign. He is despot ruler. He is the one that holds all things together all power is in his hand. And if God chooses to choose who he wants to choose, it's nothing that you and I can do about it. You can't stop it. No use of you being jealous about it. Don't get mad about it. That was God's choice. Huh? 
He chose Jacob. He chose the younger over the older. Amen. See, he chose him to do what? To carry on the inheritance, to carry on the blessing, to carry on the covenantal promises of their grandfather Abraham. See, see, watch this. Over in Genesis 25, 23, when 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 Rebecca said, I got some, I got some prenatal stuff going on in me. There's a war, they they fighting. I got babies in the inside of my womb fighting. They they striving in the womb. They battling, amen. Didn't even hit, didn't even hit outside yet. They fighting in the womb, amen. Watch this. And then the Lord said to her, Two nations are in you, girl. In your womb, two peoples from, and you'll be saying, watch this. What he, what he was saying was, watch this, there's two things going on. You got darkness and lightness in your womb. You got righteousness and unrighteousness in your womb. And there's a battle going on. Amen? And, and watch this. And, and, and one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. See, 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 God, he chose Jacob. He chose Jacob before Jacob was even born. Before Jacob could cross any T's or dot any I's, God chose him. But hold on for a second. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just say this. He chose me. He chose you. Before you was born, before you took your first breath, he chose you. He knew you. He brought you. Get away from this stuff. I found Jesus. Now, you never found him, and you wasn't looking for him, but he came and he found you, pulled you out of the muck and the mire, saved your wretched soul. Oh, this, I found Jesus. No, you didn't find him. No, he found you. And so we see that here. It says, just as it is written in Romans 9, 13, just as it is written, Jacob, I love. And Esau, I hate it. And so as we look at this, we talked about Jacob. And but watch this. Even in this, to receive the promise of God and to carry on the godly line, we need more of that in our families. To be the spiritual head. See, watch this. He ain't just talking about the inheritance that I'm, I'm going to get mama's and daddy's, I'm going to get mama and daddy's house and, and I'm going to get their bank account. And, and I'm gonna get, and I'm gonna get that those cars they got, and, and all that they work for. Nah, nah, nah. He's talking about being a spiritual head. He's talking about being a spiritual leader. Don't you know being a spiritual leader is more than being a materialistic leader? He says that now you're gonna be the leader of the family, and you're gonna lead them spiritually. Amen. And so watch this. Understand this. As he gave them the promise of Abraham to carry on the godly line, to be the spiritual head over which God had promised to his father, Isaac. And then what? He promised it to his granddaddy, Abraham. Amen? He promised it to him over in Genesis. Over in Genesis 12, he says, and the Lord said to Abram, in Genesis 12, 1 and 3, and the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. He's talking about the Israelites. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about the Jews. And watch this. And now you are father of this nation, a progenitor of this brand new nation that I raised up. And through you, I got a savior coming. Through you, my, my Messiah is coming through this line, amen? This line that's coming by way of Abraham. I want you to get away from this new movement, this new movement. Watch this. Jesus is a Jew. And the line of salvation came by way of the Israelites. Amen? Don't let nobody confuse you getting caught up in these different movements. No, Jesus, the Savior, is a Jew. Amen? The tribe of Judah. And so as we look at this, watch this, and understand this. So he gave the promise, passed down. And now no, no, watch this, note this. Remember, I said this. Whenever there's a passing down of the mantle, somebody needs to hear this. Amen? You need to hear this as you're setting up your trust and your wills. And your inheritance. Whenever there's a passing down 
of the mantle. It, it, it's a spiritual responsibility for the believer. It's a spiritual responsibility. And, and it's godly leadership that's now being passed down in it. And it isn't predicated on position that one is born in. It's not predicated on older or younger or middle. It's not predicated on that. It's not predicated, watch this, on gender, male or female. It's not predicated on who's more educated or, or who has more financial stability. No, it should primarily be predicated based on this. Who is the one that is spiritually committed to the things of the Lord? Because guess what? God can give them the wisdom that they need. And so as it's passed down, it's passed down to the spiritual commitment. It's passed down to those who love God. Y'all walk with me today. Get away from with this world. If you're a believer, you're looking at who loves the Lord, who's committed to the things of the Lord, amen? And this should be the requirement for the Christian family. As you are now setting things up, who is in position? To carry on the spiritual legacy of your family. Get away from the material stuff. Who's going to carry the stuff that's going to last forever? Who's going to carry the baton and, and carry the mantle of Jesus to the next generation? So when you're gone, watch this. They're still preaching and talking about Jesus in your family. They're still trusting and believing in the great rock of their salvation. That it passes on from your grandchildren to your great-grandchildren all the way down so that one day when you're walking on streets of gold amen it's not the Mercedes Benz or the Corvettes that's going to keep them but when you're walking on streets of gold you're going to see your grandchildren and your great grandchildren and your nephews and your nieces more than how much money we got in the bank huh you want to pass this thing down into eternity. Can I get a witness up in here? And so as we look at this, we see that Jacob, if y'all remember, he had a fleshly sin problem. Amen? Jacob was a deceiver. He was a trickster. And at times, Jacob was a con man. Amen? At times, he was a schemer. Amen? At times, watch this, the one that God elected, the one that God chose, at times, he didn't even trust God like he should. At times, watch this, his faith at times was weak. Amen, I'm talking about the one that God elected. No, no, I'm talking about the one that God called. Huh? And at times, his, his faith was weak and it caused him to rely upon himself instead of relying upon the Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Jacob. Amen. It says here, watch this. Uh, scriptures, look what it says. It tells us this, and so we're clear. It says in 1 John 1 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. We got some folks in church that are self deceived. Amen. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Amen? And, and, and his word is, is not in us. What am I saying? I'm saying, watch this. You, watch this. Don't we all at times look like Jacob? Don't we all at times bump our heads? Don't we all at times get off the beaten path? Don't we all at times find ourselves operating just like Jacob? Don't we find ourselves at times stumbling and bumbling over the same thing? Huh? Sometimes we, we become so spiritually, so spiritually minded that we can't even see our own sin. We so spiritually elevated in our own mind that we can't see our own failure. And that's what Jacob Amen? See, watch this. But in spite of Jacob's failure, in spite of Jacob's immaturity, amen? See, because you may fall down, I want somebody to get this. Because you may fall down don't mean that you don't keep looking up. 
because you may fall down. See, even in falling down, I'm, I'm still looking up. <laughs> huh? See, even in falling down, my eyes are still looking up. Huh? Don't mean that you don't look up. See, just like Jacob, who was, who was flawed, but he was still faithful. Do I got any folks in here that can testify that I'm just like Jacob? I can get flawed, but I still love the Lord. I'm still faithful, and, and I may not do all that I should do, but the Lord knows. Huh? Jacob was flawed, but he was faithful. I like, what, I like what Paul says. Paul says in Romans, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual. So as a slave to sin, and I, do, and I understand what I do, but what I want to do, I don't do. And there's something, the things that I want to do, I can't find myself doing them, amen? But what I hate, what I hate, that's a believer, what I hate, I do. I hate it. Don't want to do it. That's the struggle of the flesh and the spirit, amen? That's an that's a indicator that, that I've touched the hem of his garment. That's an indicator that I've been born from up above. That's an indicator that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life because I hate the things that I do and I don't want to do it. Huh? Then he claimed and he comes down and he says, what a wretched man I am. I recognize that I've fallen short. I recognize. Did he say one thing about a child of God? Nobody got to tell you when you fall short. See, you got someone in you called the Holy Spirit. And when you miss the mark, you don't need nobody to tell you. Holy Spirit will tell you, you done messed up, boy. You done did something that went against the will of God. You done messed up. I don't need nobody. I got the Holy Spirit. And when he does it, he does it better than the way you do it because he does it with love. He does it with compassion. At the same time, rebuke and correction. Jacob was flawed. Am I right about it? But Jacob was faithful. Jacob didn't, wasn't perfect. But Jacob loved the Lord. Get this, in his heart, in his heart, in his inner man, in the recesses of his soul, Jacob was committed, and God knew this. Jacob was committed to the spiritual commitment. Jacob was committed to the things of God. Jacob was committed to God's promises. Jacob was committed to God's spiritual legacy. Jacob wanted to see the promise given to Abraham, passed down to his father, now given to him to move on. Jacob was committed to the legacy, the spiritual responsibility of the family. He was committed to the godly seed. He, he wanted to carry on the godly line. That's why when he seen his brother stumbling into the house, talking about he was hungry, when he seen him, instead of him, watch this, he made his move because, see, one thing that Jacob knew, see, Jacob knew that Esau was not committed to the things of God. He knew it. He knew that there was not a love for spiritual things in his brother's heart. And so when he saw the opportunity, he jumped on it. And look at, look at this. Understand this. See, it wasn't the case with Esau. See, Esau, he despised his birthright. And watch this. He traded in his birthright for a bowl of soup. He traded in his birthright for a bowl of soup. See, see, see one thing about Jacob, he knew, he knew that the birthright had to move on and he knew that the oldest was not, watch this, didn't love the things of God. And so we can sit here all day and we can blame Jacob, Jacob, but in all reality, even though he got ahead of God, he was looking at the spiritual commitment. He was looking at the spiritual legacy. He might have had some zeal. He might have went about it the wrong way. See, sometimes you can do what's right the wrong way. Huh? So watch this. But it was not the case with Esau. Watch this. See, Esau despised his birthright. We're talking about two twins. 
Look what he says here. Look in Genesis 25, 32. Look, I'm about to die. Esau said, what good is a birthright to me? What good is a birthright to me? Listen to the voice of Esau. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob says, swear to me first, brother. Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up. So Esau despised his birthright. We're talking about a tale of two cities under the same upbringing. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Listen to this. Watch this. Get with me. Y'all walking with me? Hopefully you're learning something as I'm preaching this. Watch this. Listen to this. Esau, get this rooted, Esau sur surrendered his birthright not because he was so hungry. I want you to get this. Not because, not because uh, there was no food to eat, because watch this, watch this. Esau was in a privileged family. Esau's daddy was rich. Their granddaddy was rich. Abraham was a rich believer. Amen. He was a prosperous believer, passed down to his son Isaac, so when Esau came into the crib, watch this, there was a lot of other food he could have ate. Food all over the place. They weren't in poverty. They were a privileged, blessed family. And I'm stop for a minute. Let me just stop for a minute. We got some families in here that are privileged and blessed. God has found favor on you. God has rained down his blessings upon you. We have so much to be thankful for. Huh? God has been good to us. First Lady and I, every once in a while, every, we'll sit back and we'll just look. Not that we got all of this, but we got enough. We ain't got enough that God has shown himself strong that we can sit back and say, thank you, Lord. I mean, if I want, I mean, watch this, I'm not boasting. If I want to go into my refrigerator and get me out a pitcher of Kool-Aid, I can get it. If I want to make me a bologna sandwich, I can get it. Huh? If I want to have a change of clothes, I can change. I got any witnesses up in here? And every once in a while, I can go into a drawer and find me a couple pennies to put some gas in my car, and I'll say, thank you, Lord. See, watch this. Esau came from a godly, privileged, blessed, highly favored family. So him coming in talking about he hungry, mm-mm. Watch this. Esau, watch this. Esau's physical hunger allowed him to put more value, more importance on the physical than the spiritual. Watch this. Let me hold on to your seats. See, watch this. The birthright meant nothing to Esau. See, Esau didn't care about what God was doing. He didn't care about no spiritual things. See, see, it wasn't important to him about the birthright. See, watch this. As we look at this, in other words, the temporary bowl of soup was more desirable than being a part of representing the legacy that Jesus Christ was going to come through. You, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking. Watch this. Even though he was in the right family, Esau didn't have the right heart. Even though he saw godliness all around him, godliness was not in him. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Because we're in this easy believism church now. We got this, this, this liberal easy believism stuff, amen? And so watch this. Look at this. Understand this. Hold on to your seat. See the misconceptions that Jacob caused Esau. Watch this. Esau is a picture of those who are more concerned about earthly, fleshly stuff more so than spiritual, godly stuff. Esau's a picture, church. He's a picture of those who are more concerned about this world and the fleshly stuff and the physical stuff that the physical, watch this, supersedes the spiritual. Amen? He had more value in the earthly stuff was more important. And watch this, and, and the temporary um, fleshly pleasures over the eternal godly promises and rewards. 
Walk with me today. Esau had no capacity for God. Hmm. That's a hard word, pastor. No, it's in the book. He had no capacity for God. But Jacob, his twin, knew it. He knew it. He knew his brother did not want to be the family priest. He knew that his brother wasn't concerned about the godly line. He knew that his brother wasn't concerned about the line that leads to Christ. And he had no desire, no appreciation for spiritual matters. Watch this. Hold on to your seats. As we've been preaching this, and we've been looking at this throughout church, your time in church, see, the misconception is that Jacob caused Esau to miss his blessing. That's the misconception. You know, Jacob, he caught, you know how we put blame on? Jacob, he caused him to miss his blessing. He cheated him out of his blessing. That Jacob, he stole, watch this, Jacob stole Esau's blessing. That no good Jacob. He stole his birthright. He, he went underneath of him and he, and, he, and he swindled him. He stole it, amen? But that's not what God's words say. That's not what God's words say. See, see, watch this. God's word squarely put the blame on Esau. Look what it says. Look what it says. Go with me real quick. Watch this. Watch this. Look what it says in Hebrews 12. Now, now one thing about God, God, he, he'll take the Old Testament, bring it to the New Testament so we can learn a great principle. Look what he says in Hebrews real quick, 12, 15 through 17. Watch this. Watch this. Look how this is so important to God that he places Esau. That's how important it is to God rooted that he places Esau in the New Testament so that the New Testament saint can read about an Old Testament on an Old Testament narrative. Look what he says here. Why? Because there's a strict warning. Look what he says in Hebrews. He says, see to it that no one falls short. Look at the warning of the grace of God. That no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll exegete that and break that down one day. See to it that no one, here we go, see to it that no one is sexually immoral. Can I get an amen? Here we go. Or is godless like Esau. Make sure the warning that you don't let bitterness come in your heart, that you don't want to do nothing for the Lord, serve the Lord, and, and watch this, it spreads to others. Make sure you ain't getting caught up in sexual immorality, amen, but make sure you also are not godless like Esau, mm -mm -mm. who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, after he understood what he did and he went back and he ran back to Isaac and he ran back to Isaac. You go down a couple of chapters around chapter 27, 28 and he finds out that now the blessing is gone. He runs back to Isaac crying with tears of crocodile tears that have no repentance. He's only crying because now the material wealth is gone. He don't want God. He wants the stuff. It's something when you want the stuff, but you don't want God. You, you want all the blessings. I hear people that, oh, the Lord is blessing me, but, but you want the stuff, but you don't want God. You don't want to talk to God. You don't want to worship God. You don't want to be around God, but you want to tell me all you want is the stuff. Jesus said, you follow me just for the loaves and the fishes. You really don't want me. Huh? You just want to be blessed. I hear the new, I'm so blessed. Cool. What you doing for the Lord? I'm so blessed. I got, yeah, yeah, that's good. But where's Jesus in your life? Huh? And so he says this. Watch this. I, I don't know. This is some good stuff. Watch this. Tell us that even though, even though Esau came from a godly family, Esau was ungodly. Get that for a minute. He was ungodly. Another translation say he was a profane man. Meaning, watch this. Esau come from a godly family, but Esau had no faith. He had no reverence. 
He was totally worldly, secular, no holiness in him whatsoever. He was, he was in a kingdom family. Esau was in a kingdom family, but there was no kingdom in him. Mm. Matter of fact, if the truth be told, watch this. If you really want to understand this, Esau resembled Judas. See, if, if, if Esau and Judas were living at the same time, they could pass for brothers. Because just like Judas, watch this, they, they knew God's word. They, they, they knew of his promises. They, they had a great light in front of them. They had fellowship around the things of God and the, around God's people. But Esau and Judas willfully rejected. Judas walked with Jesus. J Judas saw the miracles. Judas is named with the disciples. But Judas was an ungodly man. Whoa, let's think about that for a minute. So, so watch this. It means you can hang around the kingdom, be, uh, uh, get involved in the kingdom, see the miracles of the kingdom, see the mighty hands of God that comes upon the kingdom people and still not put your trust in the king? Yes. Woo. So Esau, the warning, I'm almost done. He despised his birthright. It was his choice. It wasn't Jacob. It was already in his heart. It was his choice. It was, he, he wanted to temporary worldly. He wanted this stuff. Eat, drink, be merry stuff. That's what he wanted, amen? Uh, the eternal and spiritual things of God didn't come. They weren't first. They weren't second. Watch it. They weren't third, fourth, or fifth. So he didn't care. What are we learning here? Oh, watch this. As we come down and very close, I've been hitting this thing because I want to close this thing out. There's a warning. You know what the warning is? In the text, not from Pastor Webb, but it's in the text in Hebrews. Don't be like Esau. That's the warning. The warning in the text is don't be like Esau. So watch this real quick. Watch this. What is, what is, what's the lesson? What can we walk away with as we close this, this story of two twins? Amen. Jacob, who at Tom bumped his head, but at the same time, the love of God was all in him. And Esau, amen, charismatic. People loved him, amen. Probably financial and all that other stuff, but watch this. There was no love of God in him. What can we learn? What is the lesson? The lesson for you and I, don't trade in your birthright for a bowl suit. Don't you trade your birthright in for a bowl suit. Don't you trade in for the temporary the not lasting, the fleshly stuff for the spiritual and the eternal stuff. Don't you trade in your birthright. Now, let's make it applicable. Let's make it applicable. Yo, walk with me. We almost done. Amen. I wasn't here last week. Y'all know I got to get this out. Amen. The truth be told, the believer can find themselves trading in the birthright for temporary satisfaction of a bold suit. Lord, you better, I'll be preachers down at the Baptist church down the street. Lord, have mercy. We, we can despise our birthright, amen? We can, for a bowl of soup, this is to please our flesh. Because our flesh when it's so bad like Esau, we're going to put God's stuff to the side so that we can pleasure our flesh for that temporary bowl of soup. Come on, y'all. To exchange that for the eternal? I says, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't, we can despise our birthright, but you can watch this. So we understand, I'm going to get biblically correct. If you're saved today, all the saved folks, raise your hand. If you're saved today, I'm going to raise both of mine in my foot. If you're saved today, watch this. You may, you may trade in or despise your birthright, but watch this. One good thing, you can never lose it. See, as a child of God, you can never lose your birthright. See, the Bible says in 1 Peter, the Bible says to an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. The Bible says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. See, see, we can't lose our birthright, but hold on to your seeds rooted. We can hinder. We can hold up. We can forfeit. We can rob ourselves of the blessings that come from the birthright. You didn't get that. God says one thing you can't do is lose your salvation because your salvation is in my son, Jesus Christ. But one thing you can do because you're choosing Watch this. You choose in a bowl of soup. You can forfeit the blessings. You can hinder some stuff in your life. You can, watch this, you can be robbing yourself of what is a part of your inheritance, a part of your salvation. I want to bless you. I'm going to give you life and give you life more abundantly. But because you love the soup more than my stuff, because you love that temporal fleshly stuff instead of the eternal spiritual stuff. That's why some of you are still in the wilderness going around and around. That's why some of you ain't got the blessing yet. It's not because God don't bless you. You gotta ask yourself the question, have I traded in my birthright for a bowl of soup? Have I traded in for a bowl of soup? I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with it. Sometimes it's like that in life. I'm done. I, I done got my flesh filled up and I'm done. And you left wanting. You left empty. You left destitute. And if the truth be told, and it happened to pass away many times, you left looking foolish. Because I choose a bowl of soup. I choose the temporary over the eternal, the heavenly, the spiritual. I choose the, the, the bowl of soup over the thing that's going to meet me from in earth that's going to pass over into glory. I, I, I. Mm. So the question is, real quick, just write this down. The, the truth be told, we could do this, but, but, but the question is, how can we do it? Let me give you real quick, just write them down real quick. See, we can trade in our birthright for a bowl of soup when we pursue all that this world can offer us but neglect caring for our soul. Get that real quick. Man, we watching more TV, more internet. Oh, Lord, you, you, you look at so much social media you can't even sleep at night. If you don't cut that thing off a certain time, your mind's still racing. But what about our soul? No more Bible reading, no more devotions, no more Bible studies, no more filled, feeding my soul, no more taking care of the thing that is eternal, but I'm still gravitating to the things of the world. Huh? I'm still caught up in pursuing the things of the world. How much is enough? How much is enough? Enough clothes, uh, 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 enough houses, enough food. How much is enough? When is there a level of contentment? You're not going to be like somebody else. You can't live in their life. If, if they got a million dollars, you can't try to chase them. That's their lot. You got to live in your lot. If you only got a hundred G's, make it work. How much is enough? It says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeit his soul? We ain't spending more time in the world than in the things of eternity. But secondly, real quick, real quick, y'all getting this? And that's mean we trading in. We, we trade in, we trade in our birthright. Watch this. When we, are, when we are ashamed or refuse to identify with Jesus or his church. We got this new movement now, folks talking about, Man, I ain't trying to be with those church folks. I don't need no church. I don't need that. No, no, no. If you're a child of God, you need all the church folks you can come in contact with. You need all the church you can get. You need all the fellowship that you can stand. 
This new movement now. And I, I, I don't need, no, no. Are you ashamed? You ashamed of Jesus? You go out, you don't want nobody to know that you're a child of God. You don't want nobody, people get offended now. Because now they associate you as a Christian. No. Or well, now we got this new movement where, that, where I don't need the church. And, and no, no, no. What you doing? Watch this. You settling for a bowl of soup. You trading in your birthright for a bowl of soup. Look what he says here. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Don't you know who you are? You're a royal nation. This is for the true people of God. See, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm still trying to wrap my mind. And it's been, I've been saved for over, going on probably 35 years been preaching for for about 28 years amen but watch this I still try to wrap my mind how is it that you say you saved but you don't want nothing to do with the people who are saved I can't wrap my mind around that I can't wrap my mind how how can you say you saved you belong to the Lord but you don't want nothing to do with the things of God huh how do we trade in our birthright for a bowl of soup, when we begin to develop godless outlook on life. That now, watch this, now watch this, we adopt and we embrace a worldview. We adopt and we embrace the things of the world. We're captivated by the things of the world and no longer captivated by the things of God. Now we want to stand on what the world say instead of standing on what God say. What does God say? Huh? What does God say? What does God say about a man and a woman? What does God say about a man and a woman that he has brought together? God says, I'll bring them together and let no one separate. He says, a man that finds a wife, he finds a good thing. He don't say a man that finds another man. He says, a man that finds a wife while we adopt it. Why? Because, watch this, we, we, we trade in our birthright for a bowl of soup. We want everybody to like you. Don't you know that when you look like Jesus, it's going to cause a division? Don't you know the people that used to like you, you start talking like Jesus, you're going to see who your friends really are. You start looking like Jesus, you're going to see what you really got. But as long as you are laughing and joking and playing and drinking and carousing and partying, you'll never see it. But the moment you start talking like the one who redeemed you, the moment you start walking like the one that saved you, the moment you put on the mind of the one who delivered you, you're going to see what you really got. You hanging out on Friday with them, drinking with them. You want to know, yeah, they're your friend. Start talking. Tell them for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is everlasting life. I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to scatter like cockroaches. Why? Because the light is on. And when the light comes on, darkness got to flee. When we choose a temporary, I'm done. When we choose a temporary sinful pleasures over a long-term blessing, why are you choosing a bozo when you could get a Boaz? Why are you choosing the temporary, the sinful pleasures when you could get the blessing, the eternal, long-term stuff? Huh? I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you, Brother Bruce, I tell you, we just, uh, just had 40 years of marriage anniversary. I don't know about you, but I hope you're in the same boat. I was thanking God. Boy, I was thanking God for my wife. I thank the Lord. I, look, I ain't got no headaches. I ain't got no all that. Not, I thank the Lord for the blessing and not giving me a curse. Can I get an amen up here? Oh, I got, Digga Jackson, I got me a blessing. You got one? I ain't got no curses. But when you, when you, when you trade it, 
Tell your neighbor, trade it. Tell your neighbor, trade it. Your birthright for a bowl of soup. Mm -mm -mm. Fifthly, when we don't fully commit to God, I'm done. When we don't fully give the Lord our heart, our mind, our souls, we're trading in our birthright. As to walk in the manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. You know what the Lord said? If I saved you, live for me. If I saved you and you belong to me, I should be number one in your life. Now, I just got finished talking about first lady, and I love her. Amen? But I'm going to tell you what, I, I love Jesus first. And because I love Jesus first, I'm able to love her the way that I need to love her. Why? Because I love Jesus first. Can I get a witness up in here? Do I got any men that can testify? It's not because I'm all of that in a bag of chips. See, I've learned how to love Jesus. By me loving Jesus, I learned how to love first lady. Because if I didn't love Jesus, I couldn't love her the way that I love her. And then the last thing, how do we trade in a bowl of soup? I mean, how do we trade in our birthright for a bowl of soup? When we don't pray. When we don't pray on a regular like we eat on a regular. Let a day go by and you don't eat no food. Go days without eating and see what kind of person you are. When we don't pray, what we're doing, we're telling God, watch this, I despise my birthright. When we don't pray, what we're telling God is this, yeah, I know I'm a child of God, but I really don't care if I am a child of God or if I need to be a child of God. Because watch this, I can really do it within myself. When we don't pray, that means we're not dependent on the God of our salvation. When we don't pray, we ain't talking to him. Amen. We can think we can pull it off in our own strength. I'm done. Esau did not love God. Jacob did. So as we close, watch this. We done. You know, I had to get this out. I ain't see y'all last week. I'll take it easy on you next week. Watch this. As we close, examine your walk. Examine your life. Ask the, and I'm done. Watch this. Now watch this. Don't look at nobody else. Don't, don't think about somebody who ain't here. You're here. This word is for you. It's for me, because guess what? If the truth be told, at times, we all resemble Esau. We do. And, and guess what? You'll never get delivered till you can recognize that. You'll never be blessed until you come to realization that it's not my mom or my daddy, the church folk. No, it's me, Lord. It's me, and I stand in the need of prayer. It's me. And so as we look at this, we need to ask ourselves, do we resemble Esau? And I don't want you to trust your own evaluation because guess what? We lie to ourselves. Huh? We lie to ourselves. Even when we look in the mirror, watch this. That ain't the real image. You think that it is. That's even marred when you looked in the mirror. Amen? So watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The, the, the word tells us this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your, this is how you evaluate yourself. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Am I offering my body as a living sacrifice? Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true, proper worship. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, look into this. Evaluate yourself right now. Stop evaluating yourself by yourself. Evaluate yourself by the word of God. Am I presenting my body as a living sacrifice? Am I not conforming to this world? Amen. What a great lesson. What a great story. We're done. Don't trade in whatever you do. Don't trade in your birthright. Oh, bowl of soup. May God bless you. Maybe one here today stand in need of this great salvation. Esau, you won't see in glory. Esau, the father of the Edomites, unsaved, ungodly. Jacob, we're going to see in glory. Isaac, we're going to see in glory. 
Rebecca, we're going to send you. An imperfect family that a perfect God can still use. Maybe it's one here today. You stand in need of this great salvation. I know that the message was kind of long, but it was insightful. Because God wants to wake up our conscience. Stop believing everything that you see. You test the spirit by the spirit. That's what you do. Maybe it's one here today. You need to be born again. You need to surrender your life to Jesus right now. Lord, save me. I repent. I repent of my sin. Not just with crocodile tears, but my heart is broken over my sin towards you. Now ask for forgiveness right now. Is there one in the sanctuary say, Lord, save me right now. Lord, save me. Maybe it's one online in TV land. You want the Lord to save you right now. Say, Lord, save me. Come into my heart. I believe that you are God. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for the sin of the world. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is there one? Is there one? Amen. This is how we grew up in the day, preaching like this, in the word of God. This is how you grow spiritually. We're living in the latter days, and we got to be the people that God has designed us to be. Amen. Get in this word. Look towards his face. Let the Lord do a work in your heart. May God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. At this time, we have our announcement. I'm going to say... Thank you for joining us in service today. And as always, you can visit us on our website at www.rbfchurch.com as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you have a safe and prosperous week.